Well, I've been reading here in Romano Guardini's The Lord about the humility of God that's shown in the incarnation that God, the eternal word, became one of us and how amazing that is. And... <clears throat> And this is on page 326 of, of the Lord by Romano Guardini. Doesn't the great one degrade himself by such stooping? This is precisely what he does not do. Walking in humility, he is mysteriously self-confident and knows that the more daringly he flings himself away, the more certainly he will find himself. Will his gesture be rewarded? Definitely. In his humble encounter with the little man, he learns to appreciate his intrinsic value. Not that he to whom he descends also has his worth, but that his very unimportance possesses a special costliness of its own. To the humble one, this is a great revelation. When St. Francis knelt at the throne of the Pope, it was not an act of humility, since he believed in the papal dignity, but only a verity of truthfulness. He was humble when he bowed to the poor. Not as one who condescends to help them, or whose humanitarian instinct sees in every beggar a remnant of human dignity, but as one whose heart has been instructed by God, flings himself to the ground before the mystery of paltriness as before that of majesty. He who does not see this must find Francis of Assisi exalté, lifted up. Actually, he was only reproducing in himself the secret of Jesus. When the Lord praises God because Thou dost hide these things from the wise and the prudent, and didst reveal them to little ones, Luke 10, 21. This does not mean that he was, is condemning pride merely by praising its opposite, or that he is holding up to men the incredibleness of the new divinity by destroying the existence standards, but that human non-entity itself is filled with grandeur and is precious to him. This is the attitude God brought with him to earth. Learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Before the Last Supper, he knelt before his disciples and washed their feet, not to debase himself, but to reveal to them the divine mystery of humility. John 13, 4. There is no other possibility. God himself must be humble. In him, the eternal, omnipotent, all-glorious one must lie a readiness to prostrate himself before the infinite scrap of existence that we are in his eyes. Something in him must make him willing to assume the existence of an unknown human being from the village of Nazareth. Is such a thing possible or even desirable? Isn't it unseemly folly? God himself replies, no. Already in the Old Testament, He has said, it is my delight to dwell among the children of men. In all reverence, it must be mysteriously blissful for him to refine himself in the flesh and blood heart of the Nazarene. Here is a bliss, the sense of which outstrips all measure. This assuming the responsibility for, experiencing the fate of, such an abandoned and questioned human life. St. Paul touches on the same mystery when he says of Jesus, 
He, though he was by nature God, did not consider being equal to God a thing to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the nature of a slave and being made like unto men. Therefore God also has exalted him and has bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. Philippians 2, 6-9. This, then, the humility of God, is stooping toward that which in his eyes hardly exists. Humility possible only because he is everything that exists. Herein lies his ultimate glory. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things before entering into his glory? From here, plumless humility, he draws the splendor of that new creation of which Paul and John speak so profoundly and prophetically. This is what had to exist in addition to love, that Christian love might be, the love that sustained Jesus' life, and according to St. John, is God himself, is founded on such humility. God, then, is the humbly loving one. What a reversal of all existing values, also divine. In truth, this God destroys everything that man, in his pride of his result, revolt, constructs of his own inspiration. Here, ultimate temptation lifts its head, the impulse to say, I will not bend the knee to such a God, to an absolute being, to an all-inclusive glory, to a supreme idea, a, supreme, a sublime Olympian, yes. To a humble God, no. The Christian humility, which mirrors God's humility. It means, above all, that man is to accept his role, not creator, but creature, and of a humble God. Man is not a noble being, not a beautiful soul or exalted spirit, but a sinner, peccator. And as if this were not enough, sinner in the eyes of a humble judge. Here we have it, expression of profoundest revolt in the often heard words, God is not to my taste. Humility means the breaking of the satanic taste reaction and bowing deeply, not only before God's majesty, but even more deeply before his humility. Obeisance of all that is deemed great in the world before him, whom the world despised. It means that as a natural human being, conscious of health, beauty, strength, talent, intelligence, and culture, he admits to him who from these familiar standards seems so questionable. Christ under the cross. To him who says of himself, but I am a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. Psalm 21, 7. This is the foundation and point of departure of, human, of Christian humility, never to be confused with the weakness of self-surrender or with ruse that purposely makes itself less than it is, still less with an inferiority complex. Humility and love are not virtues of degeneracy. They spring from that creative gesture of God, which ignores all that is purely natural and are directed toward the new world in the process of creation. Thus, a man can practice humility only to the extent that he is conscious of the grandeur, both actual and latent, that God has planted in him. So that's pages 326 through 328 of Romano Guardini's The Lord from in the 1954 printery, printing of it. So there's that. Bye now.